Hallelujah. My wife and I dated in a Christian environment. We didn't ever go to dances and joints and places like that and drop quarters in the jukebox and all that. So we don't have a song that we say they're singing our song. But in 1996, on October the 22nd, God changed my life. And they were singing this song. And so every time I hear it, I just want to say, God, they're singing our song. They're singing our song tonight, Lord. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Amen. Go ahead, give him the glory. Give him the glory tonight. Go ahead. Jesus, yes! Woo. Hallelujah. You can find your way back to your seats. Those of you that are in the balcony, if you will, unless you're assigned to be in the balcony, I think there's plenty of seats for us down here on the floor tonight, so come on down and join us on the main floor. Ushers, if you can help me with that. Someone lost a ring while we were worshiping. Looks like it's a lady's wedding band. Brother Carl right here. Turn around and let him see you, Carl. Carl has that ring. 
you describe it to him after the service and he'll give it to you praise the Lord thank you worship team can you give them a hand of appreciation of that for a number of years the highlight of my life was the pilgrimages that we were able to make to the Brownsville Revival. Every time we had an opportunity, we headed this way just to soak in the presence of the Lord. For those of you that were not here, in, and I missed the first year of the revival, but those of you that were not here in the early years of the revival, there was a presence of God that's indescribable and part of that was because our speaker tonight contributed a great deal to this revival he sat behind pastor in hundreds of services and when he left Pensacola revival didn't leave revival didn't leave when Steve Hill left revival won't leave if I leave but there was something different when he left I'm telling you, when I came down, I missed Dick Rubin. And I still miss Dick Rubin. And if he's going to pray for people tonight, I want him to pray for me. Praise God. I want you to make our speaker welcome tonight with the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. Welcome, Dick Rubin. about Brownsville there's always this air of expectancy and I remember when it came time for us to leave revival we've never really left revival God had other things for us to do and uh, we had done our part but there was always a great expectancy at Brownsville long before June 18th 1995 there was an expectancy that God was up to something. And I think that expectancy is here again. This is the first time I've had a chance to be in the building. A lot of your faces I don't know, but God knows. And you're here by divine appointment. There's no doubt about that. So I don't know what God's going to do tonight between now and maybe 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we'll see what God's going to do. In Norway, I have a name that was ascribed to me for some reason, and they call me Radical Reuben, so <laughs> I've not changed at all. All of those who, uh, tell you what, stand up for just a minute, if you will. All of those whose name begins, last name, begins with the initial A to Z. This is for you. <laughs> and for all of those, because there seems to be this trend of everybody wants a word. How many want a word tonight? For those of you who want a pathetic word, I want you to come forward right now, if you will. <laughs> come on. You're coming up for a word. You came here for a word. I've got a word for you if you just come up here. Nobody's moving. I don't believe that. That blew the whole thing, didn't it? <laughs> radical, radical, radical Brownsville. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? You want a pathetic word? If you want to come forward? We'll get you that word tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> don't want anyone to wander up and drift up in the midst of what we're doing because this is very important because so many services today are geared at the pathetic and we have a pathetic word that we want to impart to everyone who's come anyone else okay come quickly come quickly we don't want to waste a lot of time 
God bless you. Just hang in there, honey. Just hang in there. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Oh, great. Great. Don't be embarrassed. Now, oh. is that it? We're going to close this pathetic word time. And if you wanted a word, we have these fortune cookies. There's your word. There's your word. There's your word. A pathetic word given by Radical Reuben. Hey, there you go. Pathetic word for those who've come. Pathetic word. You too. I don't know who you are, honey, but you are radical. Everybody thought they were misunderstanding what I said when I said pathetic. Because you see, we have these, we, we have these sessions anymore where, oh, don't, don't leave yet. What, what, you got your word. Come on, come on back. If you, if you got the word, come here. I want you to hold that fortune cookie up. And I want you to say out loud, I have a radical, come on, I have a radical, pathetic word, and it don't mean anything. God bless you. Give him a double portion of the pathetic. I don't have any more, huh? I got a whole pocket full. Well, share those with somebody else. Now, that's not, you got a whole pocket full. Now, go out there and share that pathetic word with someone. Okay, God bless you, just seated. That's a pioneering effort on my part. Don't know if I'll ever do it again. But you see, today we have a book that is the pathetic prophecy of a false prophet named Muhammad. What makes the Bible that you hold in your hand believable? Have you ever thought about that? Who told you this is the Word of God? Your mama, your daddy, your aunt, your uncle? Or you wanted to get religious, and so you got a book called the Bible? Well, the thing that makes this book the prophetic Word of God versus the pathetic ramblings of a false prophet is that this book is full of prophecy. Some 300 prophecies are given in the Old Testament concerning one who would be called the Messiah, concerning where he would be born, who he would be born of, the lineage he would be born of. So this, the reason this is a believable, supernatural revelation of God to man is simply because it's founded on the prophetic. Not pathetic, but the prophetic. And some of the things that we have going on in the body of Christ today are typically, are, 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 are typically pathetic. And it's the enemy trying to deceive the reality of the prophetic of God's Word. And one of the things that I'm so amazed at is the prophetic of the comfort of prophetics. And let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because I want to talk about something that is almost unheard of anymore. And it has to do with the coming of Jesus. Now if you go back to Thessalonians, if you can find that, it's back there in the back of your Bible there, right behind the General Electric Power Company or Gentiles Eat Pork Chops system. Now, what I'm about to read to you is prophetic because it hasn't transpired yet, and yet many people say it will never transpire. I had, you know, I had a confrontation. It really, really wasn't a confrontation. It was just a question that was asked today as we were on a local radio broadcast. Why aren't people being taught about the second coming? Brownsville, the revival in Brownsville, seen what seemed to precede what God did at Brownsville, whatever you want to call it, renewal or whatever it was, was there was a great expectancy that God was about to do something. That expectancy has not left. I felt it a few moments ago. It's still here. But you can't hold on to what happened June 18th, 1995. You've got to let go of it because God is ready to do something fresh. And if you hold on to the past, one of the things that was the hardest thing for me to learn when I left revival was this. 
Learn to let go of the seasons of God in your life when they're over. Learn to let God let, let go of the seasons of God when they're over, they're over. If you don't believe that God has seasons, go back and study the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to plant, a time to harvest. God is a God of timing. And in that timing, we have this thing. You know, if you go back to uh, Genesis chapter 8, it talks about as long as there's an earth, there will be a seed time and harvest. Why don't you break that down? I know theologically you can debate this issue. But break it down. In God's movement, there is always seed, then time, and then harvest. And in the time period is when the devil works on you the worst. Well, where is it? Well, I mean, I mean, if you, in fact, uh, we just moved on over here to another session. Let's go over here to what Peter said. We'll, we'll, we'll come back here in just a moment to Thessalonians. God all night. Don't worry about it. Now look, 2 Peter chapter 3 prophesied the condition or at least the mindset of those in the last days when it says, 2 Peter chapter 3, they that may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles and the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that there shall come when... Come on, say it out loud. Don't be embarrassed. There shall come when? In the last days, scoffers walking after their own lust or desires and saying, where is the promise of his coming? We're there. Because people no longer have the expectancy of Jesus coming. If so, we wouldn't have the sin that the church is living in daily. That was one of the things that was stressed in revival was you can walk in holiness and purity before God without serving the servant of sin. Night after night, people wondered, well, Brother Reuben, did you ever get tired of hearing that message? Absolutely not, because every night God was peeling another layer off of me also, as well as he was many other people. Don't think that there's not more work to be done in your life. There is. Every one of us in this room, there's another layer that God wants to peel off to bring us into that sensitivity of the Holy Spirit and what God is getting ready to do now. He's not finished. God spoke to me about the four levels of revival and when that time came for me to leave, and I think, uh, who was it, Brother Larry, somebody just a moment ago talked about, I sat behind pastor for hundreds and hundreds of services, probably thousands of services, but when it came time for me to leave, and if you weren't here, you don't understand what I'm saying, but there was an environment that many nights you could just reach out and touch God. Who wants to leave that environment? And when it came time for me to leave, I would sit there for, and we knew for about three weeks before we were ready to leave, we were, getting, we were traveling a lot around the world, and so we didn't have much time to spend at the revival. And I remember sitting there for probably about three weeks, just about every night, tears would stream down my cheek and say, God, why do I have to leave? And this is what I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me right across the street in the main sanctuary all three weeks that I said, Lord, why do I have to leave? He said, but Dick, greater than this. And that God would send this revival in stages of four levels. God had to deal with me very severely about certain personalities because, yeah, I lived in Camp Critical. <laughs> Anybody remember the message on Camp Critical? We've all been there, done that. We just don't want to admit it sometimes. But I was very critical of certain phases of what God was going through to bring, a, bring us to this point. One of them is this thing about this Rodney Howard Brown laughing revival. I'm not afraid to name names because you're going to see how God can change your perspective. I was very critical because I was always taught, since I've been a believer and, and, and being Jewish, I was always taught that when you study or teach the Word of God, there's no laughing matter. This is a book of being serious with God. And I remember in 1994, there was a, 
uh, an article on Rodney Howard Brown, and, and the article had to do with the, with the fact that how this thing got started in his life was one night he was somewhere preaching on hell, and the people began to laugh, and the more he preached on hell, the more the people laughed. Now, I mean, I mean that's, that's a fact. Hell is not a laughing matter. And so I was very concerned that this can't be God. And then it went to Toronto. And I went up there for a couple of, of, of nights to check it out. And I mean, it was serious uh, to me. It was out of the pit of hell, in my opinion. And then this thing happened to a man who turned out to be and was at that time a very close friend, John Kilpatrick. It happened in his church. I said, my God, my own friend has been gathered up in this deception. <laughs> That's how I felt. And then God dealt with me severely in 1995. We'd left revival for a week to go to a major ministry in Dallas. And God said, listen, I want to talk to you. And the way that he did it, it was not too pleasant at the time, the way that it happened. But I was awakened at 340 in the morning. I had classes to do at a certain institution there and and they work you from you know eight o'clock to twelve o'clock it's constant ministering in the word and I get this wake-up call by the Holy Spirit at 340 in the morning get up I said God I'm tired and I went back to sleep and then I heard the voice again he said I, he said I said get up and get up now I said yes sir and I walked out to the living room of the quarters we were living in, very plush evangelistic quarters, and I'm thrown down to the carpet at about 10 minutes to 4 in the morning. I can't get off of the carpet. No one's around. And it's just between me and God. And I'm knocked down. Well, I have sense enough to realize I don't do CDs for anybody. That's courtesy drops. I mean, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I don't play games. And so there, as I'm laying on that carpet, and God said, I want to talk to you. I said, yes, sir, you have my full attention. <laughs> he said, you've been critical of my servants. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've said in my word through my prophet, he said, I, I said that the, my glory shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea in the last days. He said, how do I make a sea? I said, I don't know, Lord, I'm tired. I wasn't there. He said, I'll tell you how I made the sea. Now we can go through the theological bit of he separated the water or separated the land and then the waters and whatever. We, we, we can go through all of that, but this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, I formed the sea. He said, I started with snow that was on a mountain. He said, I caused the sun to melt the snow, and in the melting of the snow, the water began to trickle down the side of the mountain, and that water ran into from that trickle ran into a stream, and the stream ran into a river. Then the river runs into the ocean and filled the ocean. I said, okay. He said, Rodney Howard Brown is my servant that I sent to America to begin a trickle of water in an anointed dead society, and that's what it was. I don't care how it came or the package that it came in, but that's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, then I moved to Toronto. He said, there it became a stream. Then I moved to Brownsville. There it became a river. He said, but there's one more level. As the waters cover the sea. I said, okay, Lord, support that by your word. And he led me to Ezekiel chapter 47. He talks about the water running from the throne. And first it's what? To the, come on, ankles. And then to the knees. And then to the loins and then water so deep that you have to swim that's the that's the flood stage of revival that's what we're looking at that's the expectancy that we have to have that God is about ready to do something is going to wash us across this world with the glory of God and so have that expectancy but there's something else in between is we've got to live in this nasty now and now and not spend all of our time wishing for the sweet by and by. And all you have to do is listen to some of the major news networks and they are, to me, spreaders of terror. I don't know how you live in a society that we live in after the, at least the post 9-11 society how do you live in that kind of a society without the knowledge that 
Jesus is Lord, without the knowledge of knowing that he's coming again. I don't know how you can do it. We get the churches that way because we become a generic church. We're generic in our thinking about God. God bless America. My question is, when I see it everywhere, I say, what God are they talking about? God is a generic terminology. Unless you define what God it is, friends, you're in trouble. And I just noticed in the, uh, in, in the commemoration of the 9-11 ceremonies that went on across this nation, the ones that I watched, and they were opened with, with clergy praying, with a conclusion to that prayer being, in his name we pray. My question was, what does it mean in his name? That is a generic terminology. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this marquee in front of Brownsville School of Ministry or Revival, but it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There it is not any longer generic. It's identifiable because the word Lord is the word uh, Adonai in the Hebrew, which means the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we get this gen generic terminology that we can use so it doesn't offend anyone. As long as Reuben is on the face of this earth, the word of God, if it's offensive, it has to be offensive because I'm charged with disseminating the word of God by the word of God, interpreted by the word of God. When I pray in his name, guess what? Those of the faith of Islam can say, well, that must mean Allah. The Buddhists can say, well, that must be Baharam. Oh, and, 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 and the Hindus say, well, that must be in the universal name of the power of the universe. There's a book out that I would encourage every one of you to buy. It's called The Name by Franklin Graham. I think it's one of the most powerful books, and yet hardly anyone is buying it. I don't know what, how it's selling now. But friends, when you stand in a room, you can talk about Allah to your blue in the face and no one takes offense. You can talk about Buddha to your blue in the face and nobody takes offense. You can talk about the rituals of Hinduism, nobody takes offense, but mention the name Jesus and everyone stands up and say, you can't say that, that's offensive. Let Jesus be the offense. And your students, you're preparing yourself. I don't know what you're preparing, I don't know what you think you're preparing yourself for, but hopefully you're preparing to be a voice for Jesus. So, I want to go back here to 1 Thessalonians where we were just a moment ago. And it talks about the comfort that we're going to receive in the last days. Brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. That's good because it starts out well. I can agree with that because there's so much stupidity in the church today concerning this issue. Paul had to deal with the ignorance. We must deal with the ignorance also. Brethren, I would not have you be stupid or ignorant concerning them which are asleep or who have died, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep or have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Friend, that is fact, that's prophetic, that will happen at some point in time in the future. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Turn to that person next to you. Look them right in the eye and say, Jesus is coming. Because Paul wrote about it. Jesus wrote about it in the promise that we find in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's prophetic, but Jesus is speaking it. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Say it out loud. Come on. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. We are very close 
to the rapture of the church. Now, for you theologians and, and you theologically mindseted people, yes, the word rapture does not exist in your Bible. You're talking about something, Brother Reuben, that doesn't even exist in the Bible. Well, neither is Trinity mentioned in the Word of God, so you have to deny the triunity of God also. But there's enough evidence. There's here's something we're talking about. There is a time coming. And yet the big argument over this thing about the rapture of the church is, is it pre-trib? Is it post-trib? Is it mid-trib? Is it pan-trib? Which means it's going to pan out okay. And we have this argument. Why? Because the, 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 the enemy wants to do three things in your life. You can write them down. He wants to confuse the facts, distort the truth, and discomfort the saints. That's what he wants to do. And yet we find that Paul writes in Thess to the church at Thessalonica, he writes, he said, comfort ye one another with these words that the dead of, in Christ will rise and those which are alive and remain shall be caught and be with him forevermore. Well, uh, Brother Reuben, it says, uh, confirm the word in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Well, we will just satisfy you right now. Did Jesus talk about the rapture? I believe he did. Go to Matthew, chapter 17. After six days, right there, we've got something to deal with, you theologians. Because if you use the prophetic time element of Scripture, it should read like this. From the time of Adam until the time of Abraham was approximately 2,000 years. From Abraham unto Jesus, approximately 2,000 years. From Jesus to our present time, approximately 2,000 years. So that's what? Two, four, six thousand years. But in the prophetic, those 6,000 years equal six days. Because as, uh, a, as uh, Peter writes, he says, a day is as a thousand years. So we're in the sixth day of man prophetically on this earth. Now there's certain things, and I wish I had a chance to get into this other one, but I want to go this direction tonight about the rapture. Because there's something very characteristic of the sixth day. Anyone remember what was characteristic of the sixth day? On the sixth day, it was required that a double portion of manna would be given to God's people. How many know that? Yeah. So now, and, and I wish I had a chance to get into this thing about the double portion, but friend, we are about ready to enter a double portion harvest for the believers. And I believe that the, 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 the condition of America and our financial condition today is warranting the fact that God is going to bless his people out of their socks because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and in the midst of adversity, you are going to be supernaturally blessed and it's going to be used for the purpose of you being a witness because people are going to say, why are you blessed and we aren't? It's simply all about Jesus. But we're not going that route tonight. It's a good message. I'll come back someday. But it says after six days. Now, if you go back and you look at this in the Greek, it says in the latter part of the sixth day. It doesn't mean when six days are over. It's dealing with the fact that it's dealing with the latter part of the sixth day. And it says Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up to a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them or changed. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto him who? Moses and Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. Well, I have been taught, and maybe you've been taught this way too, and I'm just giving you another perspective tonight. You, you know, you receive whatever you, the Spirit can quicken to you as being true. But I had been told for so long that the prophets in Zechariah mentioned and the prophets in Revelation chapter 11, the two prophets that must become, that, that must uh, be slain in the streets of Jerusalem would be these two prophets. Now let's look at it another way. Two prophets have never died in the Bible. Elijah 
and Enoch. I'm not going to it. You can go back and look at it later on, but I think you'll find it over in Hebrews chapter 9. It says it's appointed unto all men. Many people translate, well, it's talking about Jesus there. No, it's not. He says men. That's a plurality. It's not talking about the singular of man. If it was about Jesus, it would say this man. But it says it's appointed unto all men, plurality, once to die, and then the what? Judgment. Now, if we find that God's Word has lied to us in any place, I don't care how small the lie may be, a lie is a lie. And so if God doesn't take care of these two men physically dying, Elijah and Enoch, then he has lied to us that all men must die. So there must be another meaning here. Because I believe the two prophets that you find in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11, are dealing with Enoch and Elijah because they must die. Don't ask me where they've been. I don't know. All I know is that God must also honor that which is written in Scripture that says it's appointed unto all men once to die. Two have never died. So what's the meaning here? Moses died because you go into the book of Jude, you'll find that the angel Gabriel contended with the devil for the body of Moses. So Moses died a physical death. Elijah never did. So now we have a picture being rendered here that one is representing those which are alive and one is representing those which have died. Where was Jesus? He was hovering above the earth. Go back and look at it in the Greek. He hovered above the earth and it says that beside him was Elijah and, Moab, and, and Moses. Now if you couple that with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, then it begins to make sense about the dead in Christ shall rise first and those which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him where? In the air. That's a picture of the rapture of the church. And Jesus told the, the Peter, James, and John, he said in verse 9, he says, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So this was a revelation or a vision that they were having of something futuristic or prophetic. I believe that speaks of the rapture of the church. And then, and then we come back to this same thing or where we were in Thessalonians. Go back over to Thessalonians. The timing for this. You know, so many people have whipped this, whipped this uh, uh, theological dog the same way for so long that all we think is, well, there's only one path that you can go. I encourage you as students, always look for something different than what you've been told. Examine it. It'll hold or it won't hold. But don't just take the, 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 the naturally accepted term, well, it's this way. I don't know what's wrong with me. Maybe I have spiritual dyslexia, but when I look at something and the Spirit says, wait a minute, there's another way to look at this, then I go the other route. And so we have this same old, same old cycle of this argument that goes on. Is it going to be pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, etc., whatever the case may be, and the argument never ends, so how can there be comfort in the fact that we don't know? He said, comfort you one another with these words about the coming of Jesus. So now as we go back and look at this, now remember, Paul is writing to the Thessalonican Jews. And the Jewish people understood God's system. You see, God has a system. The problem is today we have circumvented God's systems and we've inserted programs. And whenever you find some, whatever the ministry is, if it's totally supported by programs, friends, run as fast as you can from that ministry. Programs are the support of religion. Religion must be supported by programs, but the move of God is supported by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have all the failures that we have today in ministry is the fact that we are working with the programs, uh, uh, programming what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. That draws people. You find churches, the mega churches, that, well, they're kind of going down now. But it's the program system. What program do you have? People come to a church. What program do you have? Oh, we've got Jesus, and that's the only program that we need. And the anointing that he sent by sending the Holy Spirit. I pick it up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 
latter part of chapter 4, where we just concluded just a moment ago, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now we pick it up remembering, and, 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 and you student, students should know this is just basic uh, 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 fundamental exegesis now that I'm going to be talking about, because there was no division of chapter and verse. That came with the canonization of Scripture. And so what we're doing here in the latter part of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 18, now it's a continuation even though it's chapter 5 and verse, verse uh, 1, but of the times and of the what? Come on. Times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. Now, wait a minute. That leads me to believe that they understood something is not being shared, uh, uh, shared here. Why? Because they're Jews who understood the system of God. God has a pattern system. When the pattern's right, the glory falls. That's what happened when God showed up June 18, 1995. It wasn't because Brownsville was more special than someone else. They just got the pattern right. They had a pastor who tapped into the pattern, got the pattern right, and the glory of God fell. It wasn't about Steve Hill. It wasn't about Pastor Kilpatrick. It wasn't about Dick Rubin. It was a combination of things that God had done over a period of several years. I heard Pastor Kilpatrick say one time, explaining to a pastor what, what, what Reuben's role was. He said, Reuben brought the blueprint. And Pastor Kilpatrick said of himself as the pastor, he said, I did the wiring and Steve Hill steps into the arena, flips the light switch on and the glory of God falls. It was a combination of getting the pattern right and it was by the word of God. I sense in my spirit that this is the same heart's desire here is coming back and saying, Lord, where did, where did we go wrong if we went wrong? And Lord, where can we pick this thing up? Because when this thing hit June 18th, and I remember in December of 1995, we sat at the oyster bar, Steve Hill, myself, and Pastor Kilpatrick. And we made a, a sort of a pact that then they asked me then because I was really kind of the one that was on the outside then because it was Steve Hill and Pastor that were, you know, that God was really using significantly in the revival, in the first years of the revival. And he said, will you stay with us? Will you make a commitment with us that you'll stay as long as this goes on? This thing may go two or three years. Yeah, it went five years. But you know, God is not sporadic. There are seasons of God, but God is not sporadic. There's something he's wanting to do. There's a great preparation going on right now. I know the loss of uh, the main sanctuary over there because of lightning, you know, that was one thing, but you know, there were more devils in that place than you could shake a stick at. Oh yeah, they were coming out of people every night. For five years they were coming out of people every night. So maybe God sent a little fire to purify it. Who knows? But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Well, that should alert you to say, well, wait a minute, they must have known Something about this thing called the dead in Christ rising and those which are alive and remain being caught up together into the clouds or, or, or into the air and meeting Jesus. Now, it, we hear in chapter 5, verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a what? Say it, thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Well, if you read this with, with just a little bit of common sense, you say, wait a minute, they were, were not ignorant at the coming, or at least the timing of the coming. Now, that's an interesting point. It says, uh, he, he wrote, uh, Paul, uh, Paul wrote, for the church at Thessalonica, he talks about in verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Then he says, verse 4, but you brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. Now, if you go back to the book of Revelation, you will find in the book of Revelation there seems to be two recognized, and there's some others here, I'm not going to get into that, but two of the major figures of his coming. And we find in chapter 1, verse 7, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every what? I shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now, if you go back and you couple that up with Revelation uh, chapter 16, you will see that it says in verse 15, chapter 16 of the book of Revelation, Behold, I come as a thief. Well, wait a minute, every eye doesn't see a thief. Not if they're successful. 
And so we see two separate distinct acts recorded here in the book of Revelation, one where every eye shall see him and another when he comes as a thief. And that's exactly what Paul dealt with with uh, the church at Thessalonica. Let's go back there in uh, uh, Thessalonians, Thessalonians. We're just a moment ago, Thessalonians, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And Paul dealt with this event whenever it would take place as a thief in the night. And he goes on to say, you are children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. But in verse 9, it says, God hath not appointed us, who? The church, to wrath. And so when we look at this thing about the coming of the Lord, at least in the rapture perspective, then we must realize that <clears throat> this should bring comfort to us that we're not going to go through what you see, at least in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 should be very disturbing if you read it, dealing with the uh, uh, prince of Gog, uh, the Gog Magog, the prince of Tubal, etc., whatever, things that are going to happen in the Middle East. That's what we need to be keeping our eye on because that's the barometer of what God is going to do and when he's going to come. And if you go back to Leviticus chapter 23, he gives us a calendar of events in a chronological order. In Leviticus chapter 23, you have something called the feast days, which most people, <clears throat> sad to say, but most people in the church say, well, they, they, those are for the Jewish people. Well, if that's so, then what I'm reading in my Bible is then evidently the church doesn't exist. What we're seeing here is a figment of imagination. If you go to some of the New Age teaching or some of the Hindu, Hindu teachings, then what we find out is that everything is in motion and what we see is not reality anyway. So look at that person right next to you and say, this isn't real. You're not real. I don't really see you. It's a ma 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 na 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 ma 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 ma. God gives us the times and the seasons. In verse four, it says in Leviticus chapter twenty-three, verse four, there are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their what seasons. The 14th day of the first month of the evening is the Lord's Passover. Jesus dies at exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the Passover lamb dies. We've got tapes on that if you want to find out about it. I think they're available through the school. So Jesus fulfills the feast day of Passover. And then we find in verse 6, in the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread. Under the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And so there's the feast of unleavened bread. How did Jesus fulfill the Feast of Unleavened Bread because his body did not decay in the tomb. You see, leaven always brings on decay, corruption. I believe if Jesus had been in the tomb for 10,000 years, his body would never have decayed because there was no corruptness in him. And so we're given three days, the time for the de decomposing of a body. So Jesus is in the tomb three days. Now we come to the next feast day, the third feast day, verse 9 and 10, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest thereof, and then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits, your harvest, whatever, whatever. Now, that's an interesting point because Jesus is referred to as the first fruits of the resurrection. This is three days after Passover, exactly the time when Jesus resurrected out of the tomb. He fulfills the feast of first fruits. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Now, the next feast that we come to is in verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days and you shall offer a new meat offering. Now, this is talking about Pentecost. Now, this is where the church is tied to this system of God's chronicling of events that take place. Why? Now, I said a little while ago, I said, then, then, you know, if, if these feast days are directed at the nation of Israel only, no church exists because the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came. You guys look at me like a dog looking at a new pan, but there's the system. So really, now, now we see the, 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 the feast days are tied to the church because the church was begun on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost. 
that is a Jewish feast day, but the church was birthed on it, so now that ties the church to the system of God. That's what's wrong. One of the things that's wrong with the church today, they don't have any Judeo, Ju Judeo understanding of their root system. Now, the very next feast day that you see, now all of those feast days, the first four, dealing with Passover, uh, unleavened bread, we have the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost were all fulfilled. But there's a next feast day. In the chronological order that we see here, the next feast day we find in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, and a what? Holy convocation, that word convocation means a gathering. So at the sound of a trump, there's going to be some kind of a gathering. Now it seems to fit together with what we see that there's a blowing of the shofar. The dead in Christ are going to meet Jesus in the air, and those which are alive and remain shall also be called up to meet Jesus in the air. There's going to be a holy gathering at the sound of a shofar. That is the chronological order that we have had thus far. Yom Teruah, the day of the blowing of the shofar, has not occurred. That will be coinciding with the rapture of the church. Well, Brother Reuben, doesn't the Word of God say that no man knows the hour nor the day? Absolutely. Because if we were raptured at this moment right now, that how many ever multitude would be there in the presence of the Lord, we could begin to compare notes. And if we compared notes, we would find out that there would be 24 different hour time periods that the rapture would have occurred with people involved. Because there are 24 hour time periods on this earth, all around the earth, and there are two days going on on the earth at the same time. One person can say, gee, I got raptured at 9 o'clock Monday night. Well, it couldn't have been, man. It was, it was 4.30 in the morning, Tuesday morning when I got raptured. No, it says it happens in the twinkling of an eye. No man knows the hour nor the day. But we do know that there is some signs of the times that Paul talked about that we would know of. And because we've thrown out the Old Testament, we've taken anything that's been Jewish, and we've produced for ourselves in the Western mindset a Hellenized, Latinized, and de-Judaized gospel, and that's why we're in such confusion. If we come back to the roots, they have to produce the truth. And then we go on and we find that the next feast day, the sixth feast day, which has not been fulfilled, speaks of the atonement or the salvation of Israel. And then in just a few weeks or in a few days, we have the next feast day being celebrated. We find it in verse 34, speak unto the children of Israel, saying the 15th day of this month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So now we have the Feast of Tabernacles is the conclusion of the six days of man. And in that, then what we find is that when Jesus comes back and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, when every eye shall see him, goes into Jerusalem, even though it's in total ruin, and sets up his kingdom to rule and to reign, he will rule and reign for a thousand years on this earth. But what's this deal about the church and when the church is raptured? Is it mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, whatever? Well, I'm going to go through some things for you right now. and Pay attention to what we're going to say because, it, as I said before, I think one of the issues, and I don't have time to get into everything because time is fleeting, but if we go to this issue of the rapture of the church, the timing for the rapture of the church, then... If we look at the reason for the tribulation coming, it begins to shed light on who's involved with the tribulation. And then we determine who is involved with the, with the tribulation period. Then it kind of helps us begin to make, through a process of elimination, begin to, 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 to make some sense out of these parts we've already put together tonight, the chronology of the feast days, etc., and whatever. And what you'll find, and I don't have time to get into it tonight, but what you'll find out is that there's a time period that's referred to in, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 30, and it speaks about a time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Jacob's, and, 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 and it's related to this thing that Jesus said. He said, there's a time coming that no man should, has ever seen before, nor will he ever see again. It's called the Great Tribulation Period. And I believe it begins with Ezekiel 38 and 39. I don't have time to go back there, but go back and study that. That will precede 
either right after the rapture of the church or just before the rapture of the church. And that's why it's so important to look at what's going on in Israel today. You know, when, uh, when, when in Hebrew the phrase Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim, is mentioned, it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know, there will never be peace in Jerusalem. What you're praying for when you're praying for the peace of Jerusalem is the coming of the Prince of Peace, the Messiah. And so as we look at this chain of events, and we look, the more we see, and, and, and here again, I wish I had time to get into it because I don't have time to get into everything tonight about this. Go back and study some yourself. That's why you're in school. That's why you have enough brains to, to be able to decipher that which is true and that which is not true. But when you go back and look at this, you'll find out that the whole problem that we find coming up in the Scriptures has to do with the centering at the river Euphrates because the four angels that are locked in chains are there in the river Euphrates. It's a Middle Eastern conflict. And if you go back and you study the book of Revelation, you'll find only a third of the trees are destroyed, only a third of the grass is burned up, only a third of the water is made not drinkable. And if you go back and you put a pin right at the river Euphrates and draw a circle around it, and it will encompass Turkey and Iraq and Iran, and over here we have Syria, all of these Middle Eastern countries, Israel, whatever, that encompasses about one third of the land mass of the world. It's a Middle Eastern conflict. Now, I look at the tribulation coming and in, in, in this way, that the tribulation has two perspectives. Number one, there's the point of impact. It's like dropping a stone into a pond. You have the point of impact, but at the point of impact, that causes the ripples to affect the whole of the pond. Even though you have a point of impact, then you have the effect of the impact. And yes, the tribulation will affect everyone on the face of this earth, but God is not sending the tribulation to bring the earth to repentance. He's after the nation of Israel because all of this happens after the rapture of the church. He's already got his church with him. Now, if you're post-tribulation or mid-tribulation, I guess you probably just a moment ago just got a real barb in your heart. Well, I'm going on the first load. And I think that the Word of God speaks about going on the first load. And you can hang on, hang on to all your theologies and whatever, but, but, you know, I think you'll, by the time we get finished tonight, may at least reconsider your positions on what the rapture of the church is all about and have this expectancy, man, I'm not going to be here. I'm out of here. First load. Tickets punched, ready to go. Let's see here what we're covering. I've bounced around so much here. When we watch for the coming of Jesus with expectancy, the one result that that produces is it causes us to keep the bride pure. You know, we had for five years the preaching every night of repentance and sin and righteousness and holiness. But we've got to understand that what really keeps us pure is expecting if Jesus, if you really expected Jesus would come tonight, I promise you, you'd be getting your laundry pretty clean before he came. So if we live with the expectancy that the early church lived with, we wouldn't have to deal with the sin issue. We wouldn't have to deal with the holiness and the righteousness issue. We each would take care of our own garments because it talks about garments being stained and spotted. We would be taking care of our own garments instead of saying, oh, well, maybe he'll come today, maybe he won't. I promise you the majority of you people in this room right now have very little expectancy that Jesus could come tomorrow. And I woke up several weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, and I had that same revelation come to me. Was I really expecting Jesus? Or was I just wording some or mouthing some religious phrase? Friends, I'm getting serious because I see things can happen in the twinkling of an eye. Do you realize that if these countries that, that surround Israel, and it seems to be that everyone, all the Muslim nations, or at least the Islamic nations, can you imagine two billion Islamic people who, and that's approximate what the, approximately what the strength of Islam is now, about two billion people coming against the nation of Israel. Do you know what a nation of Israel will never, ever again have another Masada? And they're going to do whatever it takes for self-survival. And they have weapons just as powerful, if not as pow more powerful than America has. They have neutron capabilities. 
Do you think that they're going to let these people come in and take their nation? Absolutely not. There's going to be a trigger there somewhere. And in the point of self-survival, they're going to unleash what I think happens in Ezekiel 38 and 39 for self-preservation. The only people that seem to be even standing anywhere close to them now is America. And then with what Powell said today about the declaration in 2003, I don't know if you read this or not, but in 2003 they will have a Palestinian state. Well, it's not the issue of Palestinian state. It's because, you know, it's not the coexistence between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The Palestinian mindset is us and not them. So there's no peaceful coexistence there, never will be, until every Jew is driven into the sea and is drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. Only then will they feel like that they have conquered the enemy. So watching produces an expectancy. Watching is a safety for strain, from strain, from strain. Not wanting to be found unfaithful. Now, I like this uh, uh, dealing with the looking for the coming of Jesus. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Some of you students tomorrow can go back and check up on this wording. I've already done it, but just for the sake of your own understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 21. Let's make it verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be what? Ananthema what? Maranatha. It seems to be one word, but it's not. Because the word anathema means banned or excommunicated. The word Maranatha has to do with our Lord's coming. And so what Paul is saying here to the church at Corinth, he said, let them be banned from the church. Or let them be cast out or excommunicated if they're not looking for the coming of Jesus. That's pretty strong. Most of us in this room would probably be out in the, out in the street. This expectancy is gone in the church, and I don't know what it's going to take to get it back, but it has to come back. Now, I'm going to run through some things here real quick. You can take notes. Jeremiah 30 and 7, a little while ago, we talked about that this trouble, this tribulation is referred to as Jacob's trouble. What was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. Now you've got a source to know what the trouble is all about. It's Israel's problem and not anyone else's. Jesus records this event in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 through 22, Mark chapter 13, verse 20. Jesus said he came but to who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, 6, Matthew 15, 24. So the message to Israel was the theme of Jesus, not to the world. Only when they resisted and refused him did he reject them and say, now I'll give it to another nation or nations or the goyim. So we have one thing in common in these concept and precepts of tribulation, there's a pre-mid or a post. In other words, there's something, uh, if it's a pre-tribulation rapture, it happens before the tribulation. If it's mid-tribulation rapture, it's somewhere in the middle around uh, uh, Revelation chapter 11 or so. Or if we have a post-tribulation rapture, then it's after everything's all over with. Discover the reason for the tribulation or God's intent, and you understand the whole system that God has to bring the nation of Israel to their knees. You look at Israel as a holy nation, it's probably one of the most unholy nations in the world. What you see when you go as a tourist is just a small portion of the Hasidim or Hasidics at the Western Wall, etc., whatever, but the majority of Israel. They, a couple of years ago, I don't know what the modern day statistics are, and we have some people here who are, are missionaries to Israel. Karen Goodman there, she may be able to verify this, I don't know, but uh, several years ago, Israel was the abortion capital of the Middle East. In other words, per capita, the abortion rate was higher than anywhere else in the world. Penthouse, Hustler, some of these smutty magazines are translated into Yiddish and sold out at the newsstands before they ever get to the newsstands. They're the abortion capital of the Middle East. They're also the smut capital or the pornography capital of the Middle East now. 
So Israel is a nation far from God, and God's promise was to the nation of Israel, as long as I'm working with men, there will be Jewish people on the face of this earth. That's God's promise. He said, if I ever forget you, he said, it'd be like a woman who has a child, a suckling child, a, a, a mother who has a suckling child, would better forget her child, and I'll ever forget you, Israel, if I forget to love you. Go to Jeremiah's right in Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah talks about that the sun, the moon, the very existence of things in the terrestrial and the heavenlies would dissolve if he ever forgot to love the nation of Israel. God chose a people for himself, Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8. I chose you not because you were mighty in number, but because I loved you. God separated us as Jews from all other inhabitants of the earth. Even to the point, even in the New Testament, we find that separation when Peter went to the house of Cornelius. God had to deal with Peter because as Peter said, it's an unlawful thing for a man who is a Jew to keep company with one who is not a Jew. Now well, that's New Testament. We were separated to, 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 to not be married to any other people of any other nations. Our laws, our patterns were God's, not the world's system. God gave us, the Jew, a unique lifestyle. He gave us the feast days that we just mentioned just a moment ago. God and his timing. Psalm 102, verse 13 through 16. There's a time that God will favor Zion once again. There was a time for the Jewish Messiah to come. Galatians 4, chapter 4, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. God gives the Gentiles a time period. We find it, let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 11. We find that God gives to us a time period for the age of the Gentiles or the fullness of the Gentiles. You find it in the latter part of Romans chapter 11 verse 25. I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until what? The fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now if you go back to Daniel, you will find this division very evident, at least it's evident to me. Go back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. And if we chronicle what is related to here in Daniel, we'll see Daniel chapter 9, there was a time, a specific time for the Messiah to come. We use this in, in Jewish evangelism many times. Daniel chapter 9, it starts out in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now you can go back and I think it exists 138 times throughout the Bible, two times in the New Testament, that when the word thy people is mentioned, it is exclusively about Israel. And so we see that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Who? The Jewish people. And it goes on to talk about a decree to restore and, build, and rebuild Jerusalem, verse 25, after the Babylonian destruction of the temple. To build the second temple period, it says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the gathering forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. After three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. That's the death of Jesus. Now we find in the latter part of verse 26 that they shall destroy the city. Here we can put that at 70 A.D. or C.E., whatever you use for criteria to determine that time period of what we call New Testament. So here we see that Jesus had to come. The city is destroyed. We pick it up in verse 27. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or seven more years. And so we see God has chronicled a time of the coming of the Messiah, a time, listen, this is why we use it in Jewish evangelism because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD or CE. If that's so, then the Messiah had to come. You don't wait for the Messiah to come. He's already come. If not, then Daniel the prophet has lied to us. And so there's a time sandwiched in between the 69th prophetic week and the 70th prophetic week dealing with the nation of Israel. There's a time sandwiched in that's referred to as the time of the Gentiles. The one that began on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost and will end on the day of Yom Teruah, the blowing of the shofar. Then the Gentiles are out and now God once again favors Zion to bring them to repentance. But we're the church. We're the, ones, we're the ones sandwiched in between here, both Jew and Gentile. So we see that Daniel depicts the date, or at least the death time period of the Messiah. We also have a, a, a sheet that I brought in. If, if, if you contact, uh, I don't have to have it now, but if you contact our office, we'll send it to you. It, 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 it chronicles the exact time period that Messiah had to die, and you can come up with the fact that this was de decreed in 446 B.C. by King Artaxerxes. 
to rebuild and, 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 and the temple in Jerusalem. And so you can work it out on a piece of paper. We'll give it to you. It won't cost you anything. Just ask uh, uh, for uh, Scott to give it to you. And we'll show you that someone had to die at about 33.4 AD that claimed to be the Messiah. Wow, man, we've hit it within two months just by going through the chronicling of events that takes place dealing with the rebuilding of the temple. So there's no doubt about it. Jesus is the Messiah. No doubt about it that the temple was destroyed. No doubt about it that it will be rebuilt again because he says in verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, a seven-year time period, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. So they're going to once again, the nation of Israel, going to once again begin to offer sacrifices. But they can't be acceptable to God. If they are, then it negates the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He's paid the price as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But it's a time that God has given to the prophetics. So there's a specific timing of God for a specific people, Israel, no other nation. And Jeremiah, and I'm not, I'm not going to give it to you, I'll give you the references. Jeremiah 24, verse 1 through 8 talks about the nation of Israel as being figs. And if you go over to Luke chapter 13, then it begins to make sense when we find the parable of the vineyard. Look at Luke uh, chapter 13. If you go to sleep, that's okay. Just don't snore too loud. I'm going to do this thing and... Let it go. Leviticus chapter, I mean, in Luke chapter 13, verse 6, notice what it says. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and it came and he sought their fruit thereon, and he found none. And he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold these, how long? Three years. I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why let it clutter up or cumbereth the earth? And he answering said, him, and, and, and answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I dig about it and dung it. So he gave one more year to the three years. Why? Because Jesus, his ministry was approximately three and a half years. He's talking about the nation of Israel here. He's not talking about a literal tree. And if it bear fruit well, and not, if not, then thou shalt cut it down. Jesus prophesied the fact that the, the political system, and that's what fig trees, the figs represent, the political system of Israel would not exist any longer. After this four-year period. And then we find later on that, that, that Israel was destroyed. There was a great dispersion of the nation of Israel throughout the nation. It's called the diaspora. And then Jesus prophesies Israel's destruction. Go to Mark chapter 11. People wonder why these things are in the scripture. I mean, you, you've got to let the spirit begin to speak to you through the events that take place. Go to uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. This is, in, this is the end of the ministry of Jesus. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto him, No man shall eat of this fruit hereafter. What's he talking about? He's talking about the political setup of Israel. That was totally destroyed. But then again, Jesus makes the, the, the prophetic of a time period once again, going over now to Mark 13, when he says, once again, the fig tree will begin to blossom. In Mark chapter uh, 13, verse 28, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, know that summer is nigh. So likewise, in that manner, so shall... Uh, uh, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all things be done. What? Once we see the reconstruction of Israel, this happened in 1948. May 14th, 1948, the fig tree began to blossom again. And friends, here again is the argument among theologians. How long is a generation? Anywhere from 40 to 60 years. And we're right here at 50-some years, not an exact uh, time period. But friends, we are close to the fulfilling of that generation. That's why we know that what's about ready to happen is confirmed by the Scriptures. In that generation, it shall not pass. What generation? The generation that sees the fig tree blossom. Jesus saw, or, or in Daniel's vision, Israel's time period was to be divided between 69 
and the seventh week. The time in between was what was referred to in John chapter 3, verse 16, in one of the years, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's both Jew and Gentile, can come to him. Now, I want to get to, we're, we're just about finished. We're, now, we're going to get to this thing about trying to, uh, trying to, 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 to uh, eliminate what we see in Scripture to try to come up with the answers. Go through a process of elimination. Whatever is left has to be the answer. Revelation chapter 2. Anybody that, come on and help me with this thing. I want to get finished here real quick. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Anyone, just read it out loud. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. Come on, out loud. Verse 17, same chapter. Verse 29, same chapter. Come on, somebody. Okay, Revelation chapter 3, verse 6. Revelation chapter 3, verse 13. Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Now, it's fairly obvious that what we see here in the seven churches that are mentioned, each time the church is mentioned, dealing with our time period, realizing that the book of Revelation is divided into what was, what is, and what shall be. Some of it's futuristic, some of it is present tense. In the present tense of the book of Revelation, what we have here is seven, are seven churches that are mentioned each time at the conclusion of the mentioning of that church and the, and, and the problem that existed in the church. What we find then is, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. After that, the church is never mentioned again in the book of Revelation until Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, and that is only the command to take it back and give it to the churches. Where's the church? With him. Because if you go to Revelation, go to Revelation now, chapter uh, 4, and I believe here is where you see the rapture of the church. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it were, as it were a what? Trumpet or a shofar talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Well, if that's not a picture of the rapture of the church, I must be brain dead. And the church is never mentioned after this. Why? Because it's in the presence of the Lord. Now, we've got to set some time periods here. The church, not the Gentiles, conspicuously absent in the rest of the book of the Revelation. Now, we have this theory about post-tribulation rapture. Now, that doesn't make sense at all to go up and make a U-turn and come back. <laughs> you know, maybe only in Florida we have the no U-turn things, you know, but in heaven, I mean, I, I mean it, it doesn't make sense, but let's... Let's look at this thing for just a moment. In Zechariah chapter 14, it says when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with all of his saints. Now, the problem that seems to be addressed here is the word all. And in the Hebrew, it simply means all. <laughs> no theological debate over that issue. It says, And his feet shall stand in that day, verse 4, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. And we find out in the latter part of that same ver or, 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 verse 5, And the Lord my God shall come with all, or come and all the saints are with him. How do they get there? If it's post-tribulation rapture, how do they get there when he comes back with them? Make a U-turn? And so there's speculation right away that this thing does not necessarily mean that the rapture of the church is going to be post-tribulation rapture, which means after the tribulation period. Now, the word all saints there, both Old and New Testaments, up to this point in times past, all in the Hebrew is a word kol or koa, which means the whole or hence any and every. So at the end of the tribulation, some people believe that the saints come with him. Where were the saints before? Now, this kind of really eliminates the fact that there is a dominion now theology perspective in theology, and, 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 and let me say this, it's, it has been changed in certain circles because they're finding out they're not going to get the earth good enough for Jesus to come. Because Jesus says if he didn't come back, there'd be no flesh saved alive. And he's talking about not the salvation of flesh, but the true existence of humanity. That's how bad this thing, the Armageddon thing, is going to be. But we're, we're, we're 
at least in my term of life, we're a few light years away from the Armageddon thing. We better look at Ezekiel 38 and 39. That precedes. That's not the battle of Armageddon. Now, I don't have time to get into everything, but we've, we've got some tapes on this thing. Rapture of the saints must occur then before the coming, the advent, second coming of Jesus when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives has to occur sometime prior to that event. Kingdom now or the kingdom or a dominion now theology is not supported by scripture. So there are two things left for us. And like I say, there's a lot of detail I'm leaving out tonight, but hopefully you go into this thing and begin to see, and you'll see here in just a moment, the conclusion I think will help clarify things. Are y'all getting bored? Okay. So there are two theories left, the mid-tribulation and pre-tribulation theory. Now, we at least briefly discussed the fact that the tribulation belongs to Israel because it's Jacob's trouble. Now, it seems to be that the rapture is associated with a trumpet sound or the sound of a shofar. And it's identified as a particular sound of the shofar. We don't have that identification in 1 Thessalonians, but we do have that identification in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because here we are taught, at least by Scripture, we are told that there is a specific trumpet sound or a specific sound of the shofar. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of which trump? The last trump. So there are those who have grabbed this little bit of scripture and lifted it off the page and said, okay, the last trump must be dealing with a chronology of blast of the trumpet or shofar. So that leads them to the conclusion then that it must be a mid-tribulation rapture because we go back to Revelation chapter 8, 9, and 10, and we see a series of the trumpets of wrath that are sounded. In Revelation chapter 8, this really takes about probably a five-day period to teach all this stuff so you get all the little intricate details, but hopefully I'm giving you enough that you can go back and recapture what we've done after we've left and make some sense out of what we're saying. In Revelation chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, there are a series of trumpet sounds. So Paul says it's at the sound of the last trump, so now we've got the conclusion that there must be a chronological, uh, a chronological order to the sounding of the trumpets, which we have here. In uh, Revelation chapter 8, we find in verse 6, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire, etc. The second angel sounds in verse 8, the third angel sounds his trumpet in verse 10. The fourth angel sounds his trumpet in verse 12. The fifth angel sounds his trumpet in chapter 9, verse 1. The sixth angel sounds his, sounds his trumpet in uh, uh, chapter 9, verse 13. So now we've got six trumpets out of the way. We've got the seventh one that must be sounded. But I want you to notice in chapter 10, verse 7, if this is mid-tribulation, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be completed, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. What's the mystery of God? The church. And so as we begin to look at this, and, and we're going to look at something here in, in just a moment, that the seventh sounding has to do when God, when it says, when he shall sound, the mystery of God should be what? Finished. Now, Pick it up at the sounding of that trumpet, now in uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying what? The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. So that is the setting up of the kingdom. So if it's mid-tribulation, now we're back to post-tribulation theory of the setting up the kingdom. This doesn't have anything to do with the sounding of the shofar that Paul is referring to. We all are quiet. So are these the trumpet sounds of the rapture? We see there's a last trumpet sound that's associated with this thing about the setting up of the kingdom. So the mid-tribulation people have got to come back then to post-tribulation rapture because that's when Jesus puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and sets up his kingdom.
Now, the people that believe in post-tribulation rapture, my question is this. If you look in Revelation chapter 13, in verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast uh, should be killed, and he causes what? All, both what? Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he which had the mark. So if this is mid-tribulation period, that's about chronologically, that's about where we're looking at here in Revelation 12 and 13. If you don't take the mark of the beast, we're three and a half years into this thing called tribulation. If you don't take the mark of the beast, how are you going to live for three and a half years without being able to buy or sell? You can't eat, you can't drink, you can't do anything. So you're not going to make it to post-tribulation rapture, you're going to have to die. So nobody's going to be there to be raptured at post-tribulation rapture. I mean, why don't people figure this thing out? I mean, we will be some thin dudes, man, if we got to go three and a half years with nothing to eat and no water. Then they bring in this thing, well, God sent water out of a rock. You do it. it doesn't say anything about that. So post-tribulation, mid-tribulation theory, at least in my opinion, doesn't hold any spiritual, theological water. So through a process of elimination, now we're back to what? pre-tribulation rapture because the church is not appointed unto wrath. So six of the trumpet sounds are associated with wrath. We're not appointed unto wrath. The seventh that we find here in the book of, the, uh, book of Revelation, here in the mid-tribulation period with the sounding of these trumpets, it's associated, the seventh sound is associated with the kingdom. The mystery is finished. Well, I got a lot of stuff here. I just don't have time to get it all. So the feast of the trumpets and the wrath of trumpets are not the same at all. A lot of people don't understand the celebration of Rosh Hashanah or the New Year or the blowing of the shofar, Yom Teruah. There are 90 soundings of the shofar during that celebration period. So there's where you have your chronicling of the sounding of the trumpets. The gal, the gal de Kia is the, is the last great sound that is sounded at the end of Rosh Hashanah. And I believe that that's what they're talking about, the last trump, the last trump of Rosh Hashanah, when it says that there would be a gathering, a holy convocation. Yeah, right, a meeting in the air. I hope I haven't skipped over so much tonight that you can't put the pieces together. I'm sure that you can. You're your students. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 7, and we'll conclude with that because, again, we're looking at the patterns, the patterns of the Old Testament. You know, you know it's interesting to note when you look at the patternings of God in the Old Testament, you very quickly come to the conclusion that God has never changed what he's done. In the Old Testament, you know, God has a system. In the Old Testament, we find that the only way that God had to deal with blood was by, I mean, had to deal with sin was by blood. God still can't change that process of dealing with sin. He still deals with sin by blood. But the Christians haven't come to that understanding about the shedding of blood because they don't even understand and realize that this thing about the shedding of the blood, the blood does not cover your sin. The blood of Jesus does not cover your sin. Your sins are not covered by the blood. Listen to what I'm saying. And I've said this before, so this might not be too new to some people here. The blood of Jesus does not cover your sin. It does not have the ability to cover your sin. The blood of the Old Testament animals covered the sin of the nation of Israel for a year's time period. At the end of that year, the high priest had to go back on Yom Kippur and begin to place blood upon the mercy seat once again to cover the sins of Israel. What's covered is still there. But when the blood of Jesus is applied to your sins, the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away your sin it eradicates your sin. It washes it away as if it never existed. We haven't come to that understanding yet of the power of the blood. Listen, the writer of the book of Hebrews says that the blood of animals could never take away sin. That's why I'm saying in the Old Testament it was covered sin. In the New Testament it is sin that doesn't exist anymore because it's been washed away by the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now we come to Leviticus chapter 8. 
why I said that just a moment ago was to show you that God never changes his patterning. Isn't it interesting? I, I, I find these things very interesting in God that it says that your sins are cast as far as the what? East is from the west. Now, why didn't he say the north to south? Because there's an end to north and there's an end to south. Years ago, I was a pilot studying to be a commercial pilot. And <clears throat> it doesn't take long in navigation to realize that if you're at the south pole and you want to go to the north pole, you fly zero degrees magnetic north. Well, forget the deviation. We'll just say this for the sake of brevity, that you fly zero degrees magnetic north, it takes you to the north pole. But if you continue to fly, when you pass over the north pole, now your compass reverses and now you're flying south 180 degrees. And then you come to the south pole, it reverses back to north. So there's an end to north and an end to south. But do you know that you can fly east or west and never come to the end of east or west? As long as you have fuel, you can stay in the air. You'll never come to the end of east. You can never come to the end of the power of the blood of Jesus to wash your sins away. And the church hasn't understood this. But anyway, let's get back to this thing about Leviticus chapter 8 because I'm, I'll just, you know, kind of little, my wife calls them rabbit trails. And that's the reason some of my sermons are two and a half and three hours long. But anyway. Ooh. No, I don't have it tonight. Leviticus chapter 8, it speaks about the consecration of the priest. Now, you can go back and you can study this, but it was required for a priest to be fully consecrated for service that he, we find at verse 33, Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 33, he shall, not go out of the door the, he shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you. I believe those seven days are related to seven years of being in the presence of the Lord when we're fully consecrated to rule and to reign with Christ and come back with him as the saints. He has done, uh, and as he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do, to make an atonement for you. Therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord that you die not. And I believe that speaks about the years that we must spend in the presence of God. Now I'm going to spend it up there. If you all want to hang out down here, that's cool. I mean, it's a cool place down here. Especially if you're hanging around Brownsville, but it's not going to be a cool place in the tribulation. Anybody get anything out of what we did tonight? What we're going to do, God bless you. What we're going to do tonight is that we're going to, to be praying for those that want to be prayed for. And I know you're students. You've got to go home and get a little bit of shut eye. But you know what we used to say in the revival is that sleep is for the wimps. I mean, I remember just about every night before Elmer got a hold of that light switch back there, you know, it would be 1 o'clock in the morning, go home, get a few hours sleep, and get up and go the next day. And a lot of people work jobs. I mean, you know, I'm not getting any names, but so many people worked full-time they go home and get a couple hours sleep. They did this for four and five years. So there was a supernatural anointing here, and so we don't want to keep you awake too much to depend on that supernatural anointing because you may be very sleepy and fall asleep tomorrow in class and have to be awakened in the middle of what is said. Okay, anyone who wants to get prayer, let's stand up and have a word of prayer, dismissal for those that have to go, those that want a little bit of prayer. Who's going to help me pray? I can't pray for all these folks. Anybody need prayer tonight? Well, if you need prayer, come on up here. Lord, bless these precious saints. Lord, there's been something that you've been up to for the last seven years here at Brownsville. And Lord, there's another direction that you want to take. Lord, I ask for the leadership that's here in the school and in the church. And Lord God, they're not going to miss it. Don't let them have that fear. They're going to miss you because they're not. You showed up once. Do it again. One more time, Lord. Do it again. And Lord, as we draw close to this, this time that, that, that your glory is going to, to, to flood the nations, not just to the ankles, not just to the knees, not just to the loins, but Lord, water so deep that we've got to swim in that anointing. Lord God, I have expectancy. We need to be expecting Jesus to come. But before that coming, Lord, pour out the power of your Holy Spirit one more time not only in Pensacola, but throughout this nation and around the world. And Lord, the people that you are preparing here in this school and have been preparing for the last six or seven years, Lord God, you've got them in reserve. And Lord, let them answer the call when the call of the Holy Spirit comes. Prepare them, Lord God. Dig the trenches deep in their spirit that they can drink and feast upon your word. 
For your word says, Lord God, in the last days there would be a famine in the land, not of the food that we eat, nor of the water that we drink, but there would be a famine in the land for the hearing of the word of God. And Lord, you said that faith cometh through hearing and by hearing. Lord God, open our spiritual ears that, Lord, we can hear your word. Lord, let us not be so logos-oriented that we lose the ability to hear the rhema, your voice. Bless these people, Lord, as they go, and the ones who want prayer, Lord God, move tonight mightily by your Holy Spirit. I have that expectancy. That's what you said, Lord. Greater than this. The Lord, show up. Do whatever you want to do. You're the sovereign God. Have your way. Set this school on fire even more than it already is. Lord, let that fire go so deep in these students' bones that if they try to leave school, if they try to walk away from you, they can't. They'd be like Jeremiah because the fire burns in their bones, oh God. That they can't keep their mouths shut. Make them witnesses. I'll bless them as they go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you that peace, that shalom. Hashem sar shalom in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua our Messiah. Amen. I want to say this one thing. One of the things that the Lord's really been dealing with me about is what I just prayed. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, I think most of you might be familiar with the verse. And it says, In the last days there will be a famine in the land, not a famine of food that we eat, nor a thirst for water, but it would be of the hearing of God's word. Not the word of God, the hearing of God's word. And one of the things that God spoke to me, and I didn't share with you tonight, but one of the things that God spoke to me when I was on the floor when he was going through this chastisement of the way that I had been critical against some ministries, he said that when he sends this last wave of revival, it's going to be through the people of faith. Luke says, will Jesus find faith on the earth when he returns? Faith comes by what? Hearing. But if Amos is correct, not a lot of people have their ears attuned to what the Holy Spirit is saying. We're Logos oriented so much and we become so Logos, when I say I'm talking about the written word, we become so Logos oriented that we have lost the ability to rhema, hear from God. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. I'm going to give you a little test. Everyone say out loud, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Say it again. And say it again. Jesus. Now I want you to say, Jesus, do you really love me? Jesus, you really love me? Be absolutely quiet and listen to what he tells you. You should have heard the rhema of God express his love to you. You should have heard something of endearment like I've loved you before the fact.